two um, with Susanna Cannon. Now, to give you a little bit of a background on this athlete, she has, um, I've had the honor of meeting this lady a few times now, and she has um, rocked me. Her knowledge um, just about fitness and the body and what the body can do when it's actually able to function pro properly is amazing. But what I love as well is that she's got a, a really beautiful personal story that happened um, throughout her athletic career as well. But often these things can make you a, a stronger person and a more resilient person. So I'm going to pass you over to Susanna Cannon now. Susanna, I'd love you to just share with us just a bit about your background, but also about um, about your athletic, you know, competitions, what you've done, just a bit about your story, please. Thank you. And thank you for those very kind words too. It's been a pleasure to get to know um, all of the people I've come into contact with so far um, within the Life Vantage team here on the coast. Um, in terms of my background um, in sports and athletics and things like that, probably from about the age of 15, I was representing um, at state level for softball and athletics. Um, and most of that was through school and external kinds of things like that. But once I kind of wrapped it up, I was focusing mostly on um, my basketball career and got um, a scholarship to play um, through the university ranks and end up wanting to end up um, in the WNBL kind of side of things. So whilst I was doing that, I moved to... Coogee Beach and took up playing beach volleyball just for fun um, and I absolutely fell in love with the sport and really fell in love with actually the worldwide community which was very passionate, very diverse um, and gave away everything else and took up beach volleyball full time. So um, that involved, you know, 12 to 15 hours a weekend being at uni, three jobs um, at the same time. So life was a whirlwind but I was definitely on a trajectory where I was wanting to be in the Olympics. That was always the plan. I'd actually um, been assigned a mentor through an AIS scheme, somebody that had participated in another sport in the Olympics. Um, so she'd been a sailor. So we were working through a lot of visualization and long-term planning um, around that. So there was a particular goal, it was London and it was 2009. So was, London was where I wanted to go. So. Um, I was planning to move to the States in 2009 to play on the international volleyball circuit and just get some more exposure to different coaching styles. Um, and I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and I was 25 at the time. And I was basically told one Friday night, um, we need a decision by Monday. It's either this six month course of treatment or um, it's a full hysterectomy. So being 25 and wanting the quickest uh, um, fix possible because I had places to be. Um, I just went with the chemotherapy and, and some oral treatment as well. So um, that in itself threw my life in a completely different direction. Um, did not anticipate the toll that physiologically it took on me as an athlete, as well as the mental effects of everything to do with going through anything like that. So, um, I went through obviously a level of recovery over a number of years, moved away from movement of any kind for about four years. So, um, and went through another couple of um, bouts of stage three cervical cancer. So my life went from being on a trajectory towards what I thought it was going to be to be something completely different. Um, and the best thing out of that, I guess, is that on the other side of recovering and finding out who I am, perhaps not as a professional beach volleyball Olympian, um, I like that you put me out down as an extreme athlete. I think I'm an extremist. Like there's not very much I don't do or haven't participated in at a sports level. Um, so uh, I've now moved into the movement and performance coaching side of things and it's exposed me to a lot of athletes. And I think the biggest thing for me is generally the people that I see in my studio are either chronically injured or chronically in pain or chronically ill and like me have had these lifestyles that have revolved around professional sports and has really taken a toll on the body. Um, so I've exposed myself to quite progressive styles of movement and methodology around the perception of what health is 
Um, and it's allowed me to motivate and educate my tribe. So um, that then led to obviously some connections which got me into the Kokoda Challenge a couple of years ago doing the ultra event down in the Gold Coast, which was for an endurance athlete completely, uh, sorry, for a power athlete completely left field. So I'd never done any endurance um, movement of any kind. Uh, and I'm now more in the coaching and training side for people that do those events because I'm never doing it again. <laughs> I would definitely I recommend that everybody give it a go, but I, it, it definitely, again, took its toll on my body and, and exposed just to how much our environmental effects can have on us, you know, when we make the decisions to do these kinds of movements. So, um, in terms of pretend, can I ask, you yeah, just yeah. talking about Picoldo, and I know this now, just if you could just tell us a tiny bit, because I want to talk about Protandum and supplements and why Protandum and what you kind of got from it. But I'd love you to maybe even talk about your partner and, and what he found after yeah. the Kokoda Challenge from being on Protandum. So what, you must have been offered so many in your time. You get offered supplements upon supplements all the time. What was the thing that excited you about Protandum and what it could potentially do? Yeah, so there's probably a couple of parts to that. Um, so supplementation for me personally has always, I've always been very tentative and holistic. Actually, I hadn't had a protein shake before I was 28. So I've always been very, like, I don't know why, anything in a box or a bottle or powder. It's just, um, having said that though, my network of people and professionals that I was exposed to in my work in Sydney, um, I was always very happy to try something that came from a trusted advisor. So an expert in my network, um, rather than something I might've seen on TV from an ad and things like that. So I had always just relied on my own good health when it came to supplementation. Um, and if ever anything came up, I'd always try it on Andy first. So he's, I run my clinical trials on Andy. So that's my fiance. Um, but when I hit 33, and, and honestly, it's probably more just in the last 12 months. So 33, um, and post all the cancer treatment and the changes that have started to occur hormonally and physically for me, um, I had a few blood tests and I've gone, you know, it's time to get a bit more responsible about understanding my own supplementation too. Um, so for Andy though, um, in terms of the recovery piece, I think has been the key thing. Um, so I asked him to take it first of all, because I knew he'd be better than me, as I've said to you before, G, at actually just taking a tablet every day. I'm shocking. I'm terrible. Um, and uh, he had done the Kokoda Challenge a couple of years ago. Uh, we both had. And had just, we had what we thought was an impeccable diet. We had the best training schedule ever. We completed the challenge in a ripper time and then... I couldn't do anything for about 12 weeks after it. Andy's ended up with knee reconstruction the next year. Like the, the aftermath was huge for us. Um, so I think this time when he was taking pretend and we doubled down, we went to Hawaii about two weeks. We came back two weeks before the actual event. Our nutrition and being deeply honest, our nutrition was far from what it had been when we participated in the event the year before, um, as well as the movement and craft beers in Hawaii had not potentially, you know, been geared towards a productive kind of training schedule for Kokoda. Um, but the one thing we had done really religiously, and I did do it in Hawaii, was to take Pretandem twice every day. Um, so as I've said to you before, from a scientific background and from being really careful around the way that we position these things or all, all I can say is that's the only thing that we consistently did do in the lead up to the event that Andy participated in just just gone and the team as a whole did really well it was a different kind of a um an event it was very very tough lots of rain and the usual things around the endurance and ultra events but um you know out of four people all of whom had hugely swollen feet, major injuries that flared up at an inflammation level. Um, and then the absolute exhaustion piece. Andy was on the edge of his team, almost not really wanting to say anything because one, nothing was swollen. Like there was a few hot spots on his feet. It was quite remarkable really. Um, and compared to the last time he'd done it, it was really distinctly 
different. And then the recovery piece after he was back in the gym two days later, um, definitely moving the next day and things like that. So I have to look at that as somebody that lives as an evidence-based practitioner and start to ask some serious questions. Now, again, and I'm not sure if I'm answering something you're going to ask me later, so stop me if I am. <laughs> I'll just continue on. <laughs> yeah, just some high-level science around, I guess, what's now exciting me about understanding what it is that's potentially created the difference for, for Andy and now for myself because I've been really, really good for like four weeks now and taking my tablet every day, G. Um, uh, some high-level science around, I guess, glutathione and things like that. So when we look at the neuroplasticity of the body's tissue, I get really – that's what excites me when, when it comes to movement as well as nutrition and other things. So neuroplasticity basically – is an umbrella term that we use to um, describe things in our environment like behaviour, emotions, kind of external factors that can actually have a direct biochemical effect on the brain tissue and then the flow and effect of that is obviously every other part of the tissue in the body. So when we talk about tissue, for me, it's blood, it's bone, it's muscle, it's fascia, it's nerves. They're all types of tissue. And this is uh, like an example of that is if you haven't done any movement for a while, even if you just do a little bit of like aerobic type exercise, you, you might feel better or you feel good. That's actually not just a feeling. That's a real scientifically formulated and documented reaction. So neuroplasticity of the brain tissue is for me what then drives higher functions, be it someone that's an ultra, ultra athlete or someone that's a power athlete or someone that is just maintaining their general health day to day. So um, where I'm going in with that is one of the biggest precursors for diminishing higher function of the brain tissue and mainly within the hippocampus, which is that front section, is free radical cell activity and T-bar curses for representation of oxidative stress. So um, if you think about the environment and, and the way that you're feeling and start to realise that that can actually have an impact on your movement capabilities, it means that it can also have the reverse effect. So if we can have a positive influence on that, um, as well as acknowledging potentially all the negative impacts that come through, we can start to affect real change in things like the way that we might actually respond to pain, all of that kind of thing. So if you think about athletes, um, when we're constantly asking our bodies to push past normal human capacity and achieve something outside of what we did before, we need that PB, we need that next goal, that next best thing, that next competition. We're already adding extracellular impacts to a very stressed out system. And I, I mentioned um, that Monday night when I spoke at, um, at the event that, uh, and my, the best representation of this is Usain Bolt winning gold medals with stress fractures in his spine. That is just a very well managed high functioning system. So glutathione hasn't been found to stop the onset of these diseases or states that we have linked to things like oxidative stress. And in particular, I'm just going to refer to a few studies to do with ultra athletes. Mm -hmm. um, but what they have found, and they found it in the placebo subjects as well, is the absence or the reduced amount of glutathione in subjects. So... We and I in particular, because it's the core of what I do in terms of movement and making a decision to follow the evidence in front of me and assume that this substance is actually the key to potentially preventing or abating the further onset of symptoms if you were already representing with, with some of those disorders like arthritis and early onset of Alzheimer's, things like that. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to supplement that correctly and have taken a line to suggest that anyone that's participating in sport and particularly at a competitive level to look at their body and perhaps think about doing the same too just for the longevity of their sport and the longevity of their bodies beyond a career in sport as well. Fantastic. So basically, you know, what pretendum 
So when you sell Pretendum as this product, it's not a supplement that reduces oxidative stress. But then, you know, after around three months, it kicks in the glutathione, which actually increases by 300%. We're kind of balancing everything out that your body needs so that it can heal itself naturally. Correct. And this is, this is probably another key piece. And, and back to that term of neuroplasticity, tissues are highly evolved, but highly acceptable live substances within the body. Um, but the thing is, they heal. Tissues heal. We as humans, in terms of our function and day-to-day you know, choices around activity and food, are the biggest inhibitors of of naturally occurring healing processes. Mm-hmm. That, that being said, it's not to say we have to revert the whole evolutionary wheel and can't sit at desks anymore and we can't be in offices because that's just not realistic. So we have to accept the fact we need external supplements to assist with the processes there if we want to get the most out of our life and particularly as we start aging and still want to potentially do our sports and movement that we've always been able to do and just relied on our youth to do okay it was funny i saw this um i had an in-home last night and there was a 78 year old there who actually had chronic pain and you don't realize when you're young he said i was a carpenter so i lifted stuff that was way too heavy for me all my life and now i'm here with joints and shoulder pains and things that they've said there's no point even operating on you because it's actually going to make it worse and he said i was on the biggest doses of trammel and he said i sat there such a skeptic he said i couldn't raise my shoulders or my arms i had I was on the biggest dose of trammel. He said, well, I can now say that I've caught down that I am basically after months of cutting bits and bits and being with my doctor. And he yeah. said, I'm off it. I'm walking the streets and look at my arms. And it yeah. was so good because we don't realize our jobs and what we're doing on a day-to-day. When we're in our 30s and 40s, we think, hey, we're, we're sweet. Everything's exactly. good. And exactly. I had no idea. He's 78. Now all the stuff, all the jobs he's done all his life, yeah. his, son, his body is feeling every single one of them. Absolutely. And if you look at things like, um, and again, it's very, very difficult to immerse yourself into a career of sport as a professional. But then you have all of the semi-professional and amateur sports people, which there's a lot of that not only do they then go and participate actively in sports, but that's after a day of perhaps being seated in an office or perhaps being at a tradie type job. Um, And it's not to say that there are some people that are naturally, because you see some of those um, like 80 year olds sometimes on videos on YouTube that are moving fantastically still. Um, The adaptation piece is really key. So the healthier the tissue of the brain and the less lipid um, peroxidization there is, which is, has found to be reduced by glutathione, is that we should be able to age and adapt with our movement. But, you know, um, the stresses of a professional sports career come with their own kind of, um, I guess, precursors to a lot of disorders as well. But, yeah, the, the vocational piece is, is a huge, a huge deal for a lot of people and that drives a lot of what I see walk into my studio um, from a movement coaching perspective, definitely. Wow. So you're kind of saying as well, because I'd never really understand this, you know, lipid side. And, I mean, I look now and I study oxidative stress and that has a massive impact on the brain as well. So yeah. well, by lowering it and by lowering oxidative stress, we're actually, you know, hopefully protecting our, our brains. And you're from protecting actually- your, natural, your naturally producing sources of, of glutathione as well because we produce it naturally within the body. Um, so oxidative stress actually affects that process at a chemical level too. So not only are you enhancing the possibility of higher function being maintained, you're allowing the body to naturally produce those things which we need to heal us and keep ourselves safe from the external things that we can no longer get away from in our environment unless we buy an island somewhere and (laughs) don't have to 
work and can just focus on ourselves, mind, body, and soul 24 seven, which is no longer realistic. So yeah, we have to accept the fact that this is the environment that we live in. How can we get the highest function possible out of it? Cool. I've got somebody here just saying, hey, do you use Axio or did you get Andy to use Axio as well at the Kokoda? <laughs> no, we didn't. Um, did we use it during Kokoda? Did you have it during Kokoda Axio or just training before it? Sorry. Axio? Okay. For Kokoda? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, so he chose to use Axio instead of like, an electrolyte drink he took electrolyte tablets whereas previously we'd been with another um supplement company the years before and we would used their electrolyte one so he used axio as like a drink other than water during the challenge um itself so hydration was never an issue for me personally axio tasted good so i used axio before i took pretendum um and i'll never forget the day denise brought it into me um, I have a very hectic work schedule and she brought it into me one Saturday morning and generally I do about 60 to 70 hours a week. So she brings it to me on a Saturday and I hadn't had a coffee yet and I was facing down the barrel of 20 people turning up for their mobility class, which I love and I drive a lot of energy from my people, but she gave me the Axio and anyone would have thought I was on some pre-workout the way that I reacted. It was ridiculous. So, um, and again, I'm susceptible to noticing the changes in my body when I take these things because I don't take them all the time. So it had an impact on my energy output. Um, and we now use it as like an intra-workout supplement. So I don't treat it as a post or pre. I just have it while I'm training. Yeah. As well. yeah. I love it. I love yeah. them all. I love every flavor. Yeah. It's a good thing. So does anybody have any questions? I know that we're going a little over time, but the information has just been amazing. I just feel I've learned so much more from you. I just love these interviews. We're just understanding so much more about how the body works because yeah. basically that's what we're trying to do is get the body to start healing itself exactly. and start in the way it's supposed to. Absolutely. And I think the key piece is to recognize how... Um, how susceptible the tissue is. And so don't ever ignore the way that you're feeling. Understand that it's, it's a reaction that's going on in your body. And I'm someone that's all about mindfulness and the external things that the mind can achieve. But at a really scientific and physiological level, um, the slightest change that you can bring about in your body. You know, a great mentor of mine has just recently spoken to our 12 week challenge is about the fact that a 10% change is a 10% change. You cannot, you know, dispute that change because it's not a hundred percent. So if you can get the slightest improvement and be patient with that, um, that's a positive impact on, on you as a functioning human being. So we prefer to look at the whole person as, as a being rather than focusing on little bits and pieces here and there. So. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate it. I know we've just gone over a few minutes. So I just really, really appreciate everything that you've given us all this information. And um, yeah, look forward to posting this and sending it out to lots of people. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, G. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.